All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, thanks for being here. We are all on WebEx today due to a plumbing issue in Wright Auditorium. We're hoping to be back live next week, so keep your eye out for an email about that. Um, usual reminders, make sure you're muted, and um, if you have questions or comments for our speakers, please put them in the chat, and we will ask the questions at the end of the hour. Um, and from here, I will turn things over to Dr. Aaron Whiteman, who will introduce our speakers and our topic for today. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Whiteman. I'm the co-director of education at the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and Palliative Care. And I have the pleasure of moderating today's Ethics Grand Rounds and introducing our two speakers. And I want to begin by acknowledging that Ethics Grand Rounds is served by the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and Palliative Care and is supported by a fund established by Jeff Sconiers and Deborah Godfrey. We're grateful for their support. Uh, Ethics Grand Rounds is meant uh, to be a case-based consideration of an ethical issue in pediatrics. The cases presented are inspired by actual events, but are generally modified and intended as a starting place to consider the issues raised. I'm thrilled to introduce our two speakers today. As I said, the case will be presented by Dr. David Horn, who I'll be introducing shortly, and will be followed by an invited co commentary from our invited speaker, Dr. Olivia Cates, who I'll introduce after the case presentation. After the commentary, we want to stimulate discussion, and I invite you and encourage you to enter questions and comments into the chat that I'll share with our speakers. So now on to introductions. Our case presenter today is Dr. David Horn. Dr. Horn is an associate professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, as well as adjunct associate professor in the Department of Speech and Hearing Sciences. Dr. Horn has subspecialty training in complex pediatric otolaryngology, and his clinical focus is on hearing loss and chronic ear disease. Since 2018, he's served as co-director of the Pediatric Cochlear Implant Program, a multidisciplinary team of clinicians spanning otolaryngology, audiology, speech pathology, psychology, and social work. Dr. Horn is also the principal investigator of the Prosthetic Auditory Development Laboratory at the Virginia Merrill Bloedel Hearing Research Center, where his team studies how hearing acuity and spoken language develops in infants who use a cochlear implant. Without further delay, let's get started with the presentation. I'll hand things over to you, Dr. Horn. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm sitting, uh, this is a, a generic Seattle children's background, um, I'm cozy in my house. And um, I'm also in a building that has been having a lot of plumbing problems. Um, so it's kind of ironic that we're, I can't get away from those. Anyway, um, our, uh, neither myself nor any of our presenters have any relevant disclosures to um, re reveal. So I'd like to uh, present um, this uh, case history based on a patient um, that we've seen uh, in our program. Um, this is a 16-month-old infant who uh, was born uh, at term uh, and uh, referred on newborn hearing screening and eventually diagnosed with um, bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss. This uh, child has an identified syndrome um, that runs in the family that uh, is, includes physical disabilities that will um, uh, greatly impede their ability to acquire sign language. The family's preference um, is to pursue hearing device interventions and speech therapy to support uh, spoken language development. They do not have anybody in their family who uses sign language um, or who communicates in any other way other than spoken language. So the patient um, is uh, fit with bilateral hearing aids and referred to our cochlear implant team for an evaluation. So here is a, an, uh, an audiogram that shows us, um, for those of you who haven't looked at these in a while, this is a graph of hearing thresholds. So um, symbols that are lower in the graph are worse hearing. And then some, the symbols along the x-axis represent different um, pure tone frequencies. Hearing in this range um, where this child's uh, thresholds lie is the severe to profound hearing range and um, we know that babies born with uh, this degree of hearing loss are very unlikely to be able to develop as spoken language communicators with this degree of hearing even with 
appropriately fit hearing aids. So this child is a candidate for a cochlear implant. Now just a little bit of review, a cochlear implant is a surgically implanted device that um, bypasses the, the non-functioning or poorly functioning inner ear and directly stimulates the hearing nerve. There's an external component, we call it the processor, and this is basically a microphone and a, a little um, computer that uh, processes the speech signal into a, a digital signal. And then that signal is passed uh, through radio frequency signal to an implanted uh, device called a receiver stimulator. This is implanted against the skull behind the ear. And the receiver stimulator feeds an array of electrodes that we place into the inner ear of the cochlea. The cochlea is the snail shelled structure, and the electrodes stimulate the uh, hearing nerve directly. So cochlear implants have become um, a standard treatment to help patients with this degree of sensory neural hearing loss who don't benefit from hearing aid develop spoken language. In order for um, these children to be able to acquire spoken language, we need to place these devices early. The FDA approval goes down now to nine months of age, um, and sometimes we implant babies younger than that. Um, and then after they get an implant, it requires rigorous post-operative um, audiometric follow-up for testing, mapping or programming the device, and also rigorous specialized speech therapy. We always get imaging because we um, want to make sure that there is a structure to place the cochlear implant in. So this is a picture of a normal CT scan, um, an axial view. Um, and here is the cochlea. Um, the snail shell structure when cut in cross section shows up with kind of little bumps for each uh, turn um, along the um, center part that's called the medialis. But this is a normal co uh, cochlea where you have uh, these three kind of distinctly formed bumps, if you will. Uh, we can also see this part of the semicircular canal system. Um, the semicircular canals play an important role in cochlear implant surgery because they're an important surgical marker um, that helps us avoid damage to the facial nerve and find the cochlea efficiently. So here's our patient, and we can see their, their cochlea does not look the same as this. They have about about one and a quarter turns of the cochlea instead of the full two and a, two and a quarter turns, and they um, had absent semicircular canals. So this does not preclude our ability to place a cochlear implant, but um, it does make the surgery more challenging, places a higher risk for facial nerve uh, injury, and also it makes the outcomes from uh, the implant in terms of the degree of benefit harder to predict and more variable. So we had a, a very robust um, candidacy evaluation that involves um, these um, uh, specialists. And the team's conclusions, I'm sorry, my uh, space bar is being a little funny. Um, the team's conclusions were that this patient received uh, limited benefit from hearing aid and that a cochlear implant was feasible, but that the anatomy made it harder to predict outcomes. But the family understood this and they had appropriate expectations the parents conclusions were that the cochlear implant was in the child's best interest they trusted our medical team and wanted to proceed they were committed to the surgery and the subsequent rigorous follow-up at seattle children's there we go so there was a, a one important medical uh, factor here that troubled our team um, so this family had decided to avoid vaccination for their children um, cochlear implants, uh, about 15 years ago, there was uh, data emerged suggesting that uh, children with cochlear implants have about a 10 to 30 times increased risk of developing pneumococcal meningitis in the first five years postoperatively. Um, patients with congenital ear deformities like this patient we're talking about also carry some degree of lifetime increased risk for pneumococcal meningitis, regardless of whether a cochlear implant is pursued. Um, with the current implant design, um, which has been changed since 15 years ago, and appropriate uh, pneumococcal immunization, the added risk from a cochlear implant appears to be somewhat mitigated, but this is not clearly proven in the literature. Thus, the absolute risk is unknown, but based on expert opinion, it's thought to be about one in a thousand, um, which is uh, about uh, seven to ten times greater than the general population. Um, the CDC does recommend a high-risk pneumococcal vaccination schedule, 
um, that is a little bit different than the general population. All of our previous patients in the cochlear implant program have agreed to comply with this recommendation, even though we've had many that were reluctant to. So after extensive discussions with the family and also reaching out to the pediatrician to partner with counseling this family, the parents remained concerned. Uh, they were not persuaded and ultimately they refused to do any preoperative or postoperative vaccination. So we had to make a decision because the treatment window for optimal outcomes is um, limited. So our team faced four kind of basic options here. Um, one is let's just proceed placing the cochlear implant without vaccination, documenting all of the added risks. Two is refuse surgery and um, either passively or actively uh, uh, have the child transfer care to another center. We know that with shopping around, they would have eventually found a center to implant this child. Um, three was refuse surgery and recommend that the families uh, uh, pursue alternative communication modalities. And finally, seek um, you know, state intervention to provide consent or compel consent uh, for vaccination. Um, so um, Aaron and I, uh, Kate, Aaron, you want me to present these questions, correct? So we have um, three general questions uh, to initiate, uh, stimulate some discussion. So one is, um, how, how should the team respond in the setting of intractable disagreement about vaccination? Are there situations where we should actually refuse surgery and transfer the care to another center or uh, either actively or passively? And then um, two is what ethical factors should our team weigh when considering uh, having a vaccination mandate uh, for our patients? And then three, should, should vaccination um, ever be bundled with surgical care or surgical treatments? Um, and if so, in, in which cases? With those questions in mind, I'll, I'll introduce our, our invited commentator, um, who's Dr. Olivia Cates. Dr. Cates is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine, an affiliate faculty of the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and associate director for ethics and quality research at the Johns Hopkins Transplant Research Center. Um, some of you were lucky enough uh, to learn from Dr. Cates uh, last summer as she gave two presentations at our summer bioethics conference, uh, which I'll speak about again at the end of our uh, session today. Um, if you were able to attend, um, you will already know what I'll share, that, that Dr. Cates is really an expert at unpacking, framing, and addressing ethical challenges in infectious disease, uh, surgery, and organ transplantation. Uh, and we're thrilled to have her uh, back with us again to share her expertise. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and really happy to be joining you. Uh, I really enjoyed my time here back in July. I also enjoyed a quick visit yesterday as well. So some of the folks who were subjected to my storytelling yesterday might know which giant of the field of bioethics, I think that this bundled up small child in the Dallas Cowboys snowsuit resembles. Um, if not, we can save it for a later conversation and get back to the work. All right, so I have no financial relationships to disclose, and I always take this opportunity to share that I'm an adult infectious diseases doctor, does not routinely take care of children, but I'm really interested in the ethical issues that affect children, and I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you guys and learn from your expertise. So this is gonna be our agenda, and some may recognize my personal favorite question, what is right? I'm going to talk about some other examples of vaccine mandates in different contexts where there's already been um, some pretty uh, useful ethics literature and exploration. We'll expand the circles a little bit to talk about peripherally connected topic areas and see how they might change our analysis. And then we'll wrap up by talking about the ethics of bundling. Okay. So this is my favorite paradigm for helping to develop arguments about policy decisions. Sometimes when we are trying to determine what is right, we are asking ourselves a question about what is smart or correct to do, um, right? So this is like, what are the scientific data or the clinical data? What's our experience? Even what's our expert opinion? What do we believe would be a wise choice? And so, uh, we hear a lot of commentary on whether vaccination is a smart thing to do. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that topic because it is. 
But next we have to address a subsequent question, what is a right, a moral, or a good thing to do? And understanding the scientific realities, knowing what is likely to happen, making predictions uh, is often useful here. We like to do things that will have good or beneficial results that we can predict using science. It's often good or moral to do something that is also smart to do, but they're not the same argument. And so an argument about the goodness or morality of vaccination would often talk about the balance of benefits and burdens um, from vaccination, the individual as well as community benefits from vaccination, et cetera. But those goods alone do not justify the decision to impose a vaccination requirement or to impose consequences for non-vaccination. And so this is where the conversation about mandates, I think, really needs to be situated is in the question of what is right, fair, or justified to do. And it's important that we talk not only about sort of the best of all possible worlds where people do smart and moral things all the time, but the world that we really live in where we have to confront the reality of non-vaccination and still make a decision to move forward where the desire, the most desired outcome from our perspective, a child with a cochlear implant that helps with language development who is also optimally protected against meningitis is not being presented to us as an option. Since this is where the conversation is gonna hinge, I'll give some ideas um, for how we might address this question rather than addressing only the questions of rightness or goodness. Um, so sometimes we will uh, say that a mandate is justified by invoking a strict duty. Uh, we may invoke a right. Uh, we may apply justificatory conditions. So we'll look at the goods and not so goods generated by a mandate and argue that the goods are at least proportional um, or infringements are minimized to justify the mandate. We may appeal to some established ideas of fairness or compare this mandate to other routinely accepted practices. Um, or we may try to flip the situation around and argue that the alternatives cross some threshold that makes them unacceptable, basically saying it would be wrong not to do it. Uh, therefore, we must. And then finally, even after uh, articulating sort of a reasonable and well-justified or well-argued vaccination policy. Um, we still have one more question to address, and that's what is right or proper for us to be doing, because we are people taking action in this situation as well. Our conduct and policymaking is also important and can be good or not so good. Uh, and you can think about this for yourself, if someone was making a policy that was going to determine if you or your child could access a treatment to facilitate the development of spoken language, how would you want that person to act? What type of person would you want them to be? All right, so we're just gonna play around with a couple of examples of mandates. And first we'll talk about uh, vaccination mandates for healthcare workers, because I'm guessing that many in the audience have actually been subject to a vaccination requirement in order to work uh, at Seattle Children's. Um, we have the same at Johns Hopkins. So we'll skip whether this is smart, because like I said, the scientific data support that vaccination is almost always a smart thing to do um, and talk about the goods. And so the goods that are uh, sought by healthcare worker vaccination requirements have to do with protecting individual healthcare workers as well as their colleagues and patients and preserving a functional healthcare system. Um, but mandates do have downsides. They constrain some healthcare workers' autonomy. And there's a downside with regard to justice when mandates sort of misrecognize or fail to recognize grievances that are specific to certain marginalized groups and then disproportionately affect marginalized or lower income workers in the healthcare setting. And now remember, just because they achieve some goods does not mean they are automatically justified, but arguments that are made to justify vaccination requirements for healthcare workers do invoke the idea of a duty to protect patients and serve the public on the part of healthcare workers, as well as a duty on the part of healthcare institutions to provide a safe treatment environment for patients and safe working environment for employees. And then argument can, is also made that the burdens imposed, the downsides, are justified by at least proportional benefit in terms of the goods, 
and infringements are minimized by modifications to the policy, like having um, exemptions for medical contraindications and also supporting vaccination by offering it on site. All right. Vaccination requirements in schools are also a pretty familiar practice, and some of the arguments are similar here. So this has been called good because it protects children, their classmates, protects teachers, and also protects communities. We have evidence that shows that school-level vaccination requirements are associated with lower community-level disease incidents, including in non-school-age people, including adults, my patients. Thank you very much. Um, the good here is we're seeking to increase vaccination among children who might otherwise have been denied vaccination by their parents. And so this is a reframing of the idea of non-vaccination um, that comes close to invoking a right for children to be vaccinated. I'll use that again, but it's not a, this is going to be the be all and end all of the conversation. But school mandates do constrain some parents' ability to make decisions that they believe are in the best interest of their child. And the same issue of misrecognizing grievances is specific to marginalized groups is present here as well. School mandates are common and the arguments supporting them as justified also invoke duties. In this instance, a duty of school systems to create a safe learning environment, but also a duty for school systems or the state, which operates through the school systems to contribute to the health, growth and development of children. Um, there's also a question of a right here. So it's uh, argued that schools or the state have a reasonable authority or a right to impose mandates in this context. And that children have a right that is being defended by the state or the school to receive basic health care that includes vaccination. And then again, the same arguments of burdens uh, being justified because of a proportional or at least proportional good. All right, the next example I want to talk about is primary care clinics, but you do not have to listen to me on this topic because you guys are home to the author of this seminal work. Uh, so Doug Dikema wrote a paper um, almost 10 years ago now about dismissal of families from primary care clinics um, because of non-vaccination. Uh, and Doug's perfectly worded uh, description of the issue is that healthcare providers who choose to follow a dismissal or non-acceptance directed at families opting not to vaccinate their children are giving several reasons. The reasons include the claim that rejection of vaccination makes the provider complicit in an unethical act. So this is an argument in favor of mandating it that is based on a duty and um, that rejection of vaccination represents an insurmountable philosophical difference between a parent and a provider. I believe that this is actually an argument based on a claim to a right um, to work in an environment where there are not such insurmountable philosophical differences that families with unvaccinated children represent a danger to the clinic staff and patients. So this also invokes a duty to third parties as a reason for a vaccine mandate. And that families represent a liability risk uh, or counseling families requires too much of the provider's time leading to a loss of revenue and less time with other patients. Again, it's sort of on the verge between a duty to the third parties and an individual right to order one's practices when sees fit. But as Doug explains in his excellent paper, uh, when scrutinized closely, none of those reasons appears to be sufficient to support such a policy. And I think the most important core argument that we see in Doug's paper is that this uh, type of policy is not conferring a meaningful benefit, right? The children and families subjected to this policy this is, is not promoting vaccination uptake any more than participation in the clinic would do. Uh, and instead, it's isolating or causing clustering of these uh, children and families, which actually is uh, creating additional risks. And then this is my favorite uh, topic, so I'll include it as well. So this is uh, vaccination requirements for transplant candidates prior to receiving a transplant. The goods that are being sought here are to protect candidates or who become recipients. And it may protect communities. This got a little bit of attention during the COVID-19 pandemic where we saw uh, examples of prolonged viral shedding and within host evolution in immunosuppressed people. Uh, and so there is a proposition that reducing the number of immunosuppressed people who were also not vaccinated was going to create an overall better risk profile for communities. Um, promotes, and the other argument here is that this promotes the net utility achieved through transplantation by creating a situation with transplanted organs are a little bit more likely to thrive over a longer period of time. Uh, but 
Oh, as of before, this constrains some patients' autonomy and, as before, can misrecognize grievances specific to marginalized groups. The arguments that sought to justify these mandates, um, I believe the strongest arguments, invoked duties uh, to prepare individual candidates for a successful transplant. But I think most importantly, a duty arising from the problem of organ scarcity for transplant centers to orchestrate listing and allocation in a way that serves the needs of all candidates. Um, so this is my own take on the issue actually, is that candidates for organ transplant represent a community with shared interests in the distribution of scarce organs, and that transplant centers have a responsibility to all candidates uh, when they are sort of orchestrating listing and allocation, that that responsibility can be enacted through something like a vaccine mandate that may, although I think realistically to a small degree, enhance the net utility from organ transplantation, but also creates a safe context for patients entering the transplant center and helps to ensure that transplant center resources are maximally available to patients and not diverted to issues like center-based outbreaks or prolonged illness related to vaccine preventable illness in their recipients. Um, and then it was a sort of common argument that transplant centers have this reasonable authority or a right to impose such requirements since they are afforded a lot of medical discretion in candidate selection. But there were certainly arguments against this, and I think some of the most prominent arguments uh, had to do with uh, appeals to other uh, sort of intuitively held notions of fairness. And so a couple of these uh, here are that differential treatment, so denial of a transplant should be based on a substantive and relevant difference between candidates. And I think this difference is relevant, right? There's transplant specific uh, significance of vaccination because immunosuppression and vaccination uh, create this compounding risk. Um, but whether that difference was substantive was not always clear. The magnitude, the absolute risk magnitude might actually have been pretty small for some vaccines. Um, and the available availability of alternative therapies uh, is going to have to affect our interpretation of that risk. Differential treatment should be proportional then to the magnitude and certainty of this difference. And so if we're already concerned that the magnitude or certainty of the difference may not be as great as a sort of absolutist argument would want us to believe, I think that this further erodes the justification for differential treatment. Um, it is better that differential treatment be based on willful difference. This again is kind of an intuitive notion of fairness that if someone is choosing to be that way, others now have a right to treat them differently because this is a matter of choice. Um, in the simplest sense, it appears that non-vaccination is a matter of choice for adult transplant candidates, uh, although I think that is uh, complicated by issues like widespread misinformation. Um, and then as uh, objections to vaccination then maybe uh, rise from histories of racial injustice in healthcare. Um, but it is not necessarily a choice uh, in the pediatric context. And uh, my personal position was that uh, free transplant vaccination mandates in the pediatric context were particularly problematic because of this issue that children uh, incur the serious consequences of differential treatment that's based on a willful choice made by someone else. Um, and then differential treatment should not exacerbate existing disparities. And we actually did see that differential treatment was exacerbating uh, some existing disparities in transplantation. There's a recently published uh, report out of UCSF describing the impact of their pre-transplant vaccination requirement. And it appeared that it resulted in delisting or deactivation of candidates predominantly from lower socioeconomic status uh, groups. And then we didn't cover this for some of the other issues, mostly because I actually don't have a lot of intimate experience with the school or primary care clinic policymaking processes, but I did see a little bit of the sausage being made in the transplant world. Uh, and so I also think there's an opportunity to investigate that final of the four questions about what is right, whether the vaccine policy development process was undertaken in a proper um, way. And so we would be interested in adhering to some of these standards for procedural legitimacy that include acknowledgement of conflict of interest and bias. These include some of this deeply held emotional bias and experiences of like personal offense and frustration that color our interpretation of vaccination policy. Um, 
as well as representation from stakeholder groups in the policymaking process, transparency about the policymaking process, as well as the nature of the policy and its implications. And then the one that um, I put in bold and personally like to harp on is this idea of clarity of purpose in the policy development and then alignment of the final policy with its stated purpose, right? So choosing to make a policy because we need one uh, does not actually give us a clear purpose to guide what policy we're going to create. It's just any policy. Uh, so I think undertaking the policy making process needs to be motivated by some clear purpose or telos and end um, for the policy making process that we can then evaluate once the policy is developed or operational. All right, but we should probably talk about the actual problem at hand. Um, so what about cochlear implants? And for this one, I will step back to the question of whether vaccination is smart, although I will ultimately get the answer that yes, uh, it is, right? So pneumococcal vaccination is safe. It's highly effective at reducing the risk of invasive pneumococcal disease, including meningitis in children generally. Uh, but Dr. Horn is right. The evidence related to this specifically in the context of cochlear implants is promising, but not able to be conclusive, purely just because of the nature of the type, the types of data that can be collected, right? So cochlear implant appears to increase the risk for acquiring meningitis and children with a cochlear implant who have had pneumococcal vaccination, however, appear to be unlikely to get meningitis. Um, looking at this recent meta-analysis that showed rates of meningitis in patients like this that were similar to rates in the general population. And like Dr. Horn said, that um, it's a rare uh, complication. And then children with CI who take antibiotic prophylaxis also appear to be unlikely to get meningitis. And at least in this meta-analysis, the rate of meningitis was the same for children taking antibiotic prophylaxis and children who had received pneumococcal vaccination. This data are difficult to interpret though because there was a really low frequency of meningitis, also a really low frequency of non-vaccination or reported non-vaccination. So the absolute risk uh, magnitude here is probably low with the highest risk being on the order of one in 1000 and the risk reduced by either of these two interventions and possibly reduced by improvements in the cochlear implant design and surgery. Um, but there's good reason to believe that there is a significant relative risk associated with non-vaccination in this context. So smart. And then good, right? So the good we are seeking here is very focused on the individual patient, right? This is uh, motivated by protecting this patient from a potentially devastating illness. And then the downside is pretty predictable here. It constrains some parents' ability to make decisions they believe are in the best interest of their child. And in a case-specific way, we may also see that prevalent downside of vaccination, of strict vaccination policies, which is misrecognition of objections to vaccination from patients in marginalized groups. Although we're not going to focus on that specifically today in this case. And so the question that we need to spend most of our time on is whether a vaccination mandate for cochlear implant surgery can be justified. Um, so I think we'll go through all of these possible methods for justification. Can we invoke a strict duty that justifies a mandate? One of the differences here compared to the other contexts that we talked about is there's not really a, per, a persuasive duty to third parties um, or a scarce resource allocation question um, that can generate one of these duties to third parties to justify a mandate, right? The focus is uh, very much on this individual patient. And so if we want to instead talk about a duty to this patient to act in a way that promotes their well-being, that probably would be best satisfied by having the patient vaccinated and receive CI, but it's still better satisfied by having the patient non-vaccinated and receive a cochlear implant than by having the patient non-vaccinated and not receive a cochlear implant. And then can we invoke a right to justify a mandate? Um, and so the first right that might come to mind would be the right of the surgeon to use discretion in choosing whom to offer these surgeries. Um, but I think that the professional role and duties of a healthcare provider or surgeon can constrains that right to choose whom to treat and not to treat, right? This, I think, 
starts to flow into some of those intuitive notions of fairness that justify differential treatment. And I think we believe that healthcare workers actually have more of a duty to provide treatment um, or justify differential treatment than a right to treat people differently according to potentially arbitrary, willful, or individual ideas. Um, and then I do want to reiterate my own belief that the patient, the child patient, has some abstract right to be vaccinated, even though they are in this situation being denied vaccination by their parent. But Although that abstract right exists, I don't think that it is the role of the healthcare team to decide that that abstract, abstract right should be manifested or when it should be manifested or how it should be manifested. Um, and I will give you a much sillier example to explain why I think that that makes sense. Uh, so you might say every child has a right uh, to enjoy the outdoors. But even though that may in fact be completely true, you would not go around taking children from inside their homes and putting them outside, right? So you may be right about their right, uh, but you're not empowered uh, to make the decision when that right should be manifested uh, or how or where. All right. So could we instead apply justificatory conditions to justify a mandate? Uh, this would be arguing that the benefit of the mandate uh, was at least proportional to the negative impact. But the downside in this situation where a vulnerable patient permanently, because of the time sensitive nature of the cochlear implant intervention, loses the opportunity to develop hearing and spoken language under the best conditions possible for them, right, by having the cochlear implant and by having it performed in the center best equipped uh, to manage their particular condition, I don't think is balanced by a proportional upside to imposing the mandate. And I think a big part of this is because there's not a third party uh, that needs to be strongly considered here. There's not a huge downside to having the coincidental existence of children who are non-vaccinated and who have a cochlear implant running around in the world uh, that we need to protect from. All right, but could we uh, next appeal to some established ideas of fairness to justify the mandate, right? And so we'll go back to these ideas of differential treatment. I think, again, we have a substantive and relevant difference, or at least we have a very good reason to believe that we have a substantive and relevant difference from the data that we have about meningitis and cochlear implant. Um, but I would argue that the nature of this differential treatment is not clearly proportional to the nature, uh, certainty, and magnitude of the difference, right? We talked about the absolute risk still being low. And the most likely situation is that the non-vaccinated patient with the cochlear implant never develops meningitis. Um, and then the differential treatment in this instance affects a party that is not the cause of the willful difference. And so we can't say that the differential treatment is based on choice. And then can we find a way to argue that the alternatives are unacceptable, thereby justifying the mandate? And so the alternative, the I would describe here as saying, if we do not have a mandate, there will come to be children who are non-vaccinated and who have cochlear implants. This reality would have aspects that are not good. There would be children who are experiencing compounded risk for meningitis, but it's probably not an unacceptable reality. In fact, it currently exists. Centers report uh, rates of full, complete pneumococcal vaccination for their uh, cochlear implant patients at about 80% uh, in some other centers around the country and around the world. A national study in New Zealand pinned that rate at about 81%. Um, so we already live in this reality. And then finally, I'm just gonna reiterate some of these standards for procedural legitimacy in the decision to implement a vaccination mandate or requirement, right? There's an imperative here to acknowledge conflicts of interest and bias. I'll bring up a particular bias in the next couple of slides to have representation of stakeholder groups, um, to be transparent about the policymaking process and also the policy implications, 
and then to enter the policymaking process with clarity of purpose or telos, an idea of the end of having this policy and alignment of the final policy with its stated purpose. And then I will give you, of course, a bioethicist answer. I actually also borrowed this from the very end of Dr. Dikema's paper on dismissal of patients from primary care clinics, right? A better strategy would be to maintain contact with those families who continue to seek care and trust the provider while supporting the efforts of medical and public health organizations to push for policy reforms that make vaccine refusal less common. Um, and this is, of course, a classic bioethicist answer, right? Like, keep talking about it, explore more. Um, it's not always the answer. For example, let's say, why wasn't this the answer for transplant uh, candidates? right? Transplant vaccine mandates are imposed by doctors on patients. And the reason that this is not the answer for pre-transplant vaccination requirements is because pre-transplant vaccination is a particularly time-sensitive intervention. The vaccines work best when they are given before transplant and work less well after transplant. Um, and so there is a loss here from continuing the conversation that goes beyond sort of the lost time or the period of sort of unmitigated risk um, because the ability to start to mitigate that risk later is actually less. But for the cochlear implant, for this patient, you actually can keep talking to them about vaccination even after the implant is in. And in fact, like one day the patient might even hear you talking to them. So Dr. Horn showed us four options, right? the option of doing surgery despite non-vaccination, the option of transferring uh, the patient for what we would expect to be surgery in another center despite non-vaccination, right? Both of these produce a similar outcome in terms of the risk to the patient of meningitis, um, although potentially a differential outcome because of the special expertise um, here at Seattle Children's for this patient's particularly challenging anatomy, right? The option of no surgery um, and asking the patient as well as the patient's family uh, to use visual language or try to acquire sign language. Or the option of state intervention, and I'll admit that I did not spend too much time on this option, it's uh, complicated uh, to implement. Um, I would refer you though, I think to Doug Dikema again, and his uh, harm principle work, so the idea that state intervention should be reserved for situations of more serious or imminent harm and not deployed in situations that are merely meant to marginally better access what we believe to be a child's best interest. But I wanna modify option number one here to reflect my own recommendation, which is actually to proceed with surgery and continue vaccine counseling, right? the bioethicist's uh, answer. And so what are the chances that additional vaccine counseling after surgery will ultimately succeed in getting the child vaccinated and starting to mitigate the compounded risk of meningitis? I don't know, uh, but could you imagine, for example, that that chance might be better than one in 1,000? I think I can. All right. And then I did want to just touch on some of these expanding circles topics. So uh, you might want to jump in with an antimicrobial stewardship argument for a vaccination requirement here, right? Cochlear implant surgery may not be scarce in the same way an organ transplant is, but the proposed alternative to vaccination, long-term prophylactic antibiotics, is scarce in some way, although I would say arguably not like organ transplant. Right. Antibiotic use is going to reduce the future availability of tolerable and effective antibiotics for patient for other patients, right? by promoting the development of antimicrobial resistance. So can we actually turn this around and make a scarcity argument? Or can we say that patients should not be permitted to choose to use antibiotics as scarce and shared resources, resource when vaccination, which is a non-scarce resource, uh, is available? Uh, I think that the articulation of the question in this way, though, is a reflection of one of our own impulses to sort of feel offended or feel frustrated by the way that choices patients make actually constrain choices that we are able to make. We don't want to make the choice to give antibiotics when we feel we have the choice to use vaccines. However, because patients are able to make choices not to accept treatments, our choices are in fact constrained between 
antibiotics and no antibiotics, not antibiotic and vaccine. And then I also wanted to touch on this uh, intersecting issue of deafness and hearing, because if cochlear implant is a standard of care treatment that's rationally desired to address an impairment, promote health and social well-being, right? It's very hard for us to say that we would, for any reason, uh, withhold such a treatment. The threshold to make that argument is pretty high. Um, but if cochlear implant is in fact an augmentation uh, or an alteration that needlessly modifies or even adversely impacts an already acceptable state of being, the nature of the arguments that we might try to make would be different. So if cochlear implant is an augmentation, could refusal to provide cochlear implant actually be justified for even an almost arbitrary reason? And here I'd make a comparison to something that is closer to augmentation, although also does serve some social functions, right? But like cosmetic rhinoplasty. Um, and if the surgeon who offers cosmetic rhinoplasty to patients felt that a particular patient was not adequately appreciating some small uh, risk of the surgery and not adequately mitigating that risk, I think most of us would feel that it's reasonable for the surgeon to decline to offer cosmetic rhinoplasty in that context. Um, yeah, it's not entirely arbitrary, right? So if the surgeon were declining to offer cosmetic uh, rhinoplasty in a way that was discriminatory against certain protected groups, that would still not be okay. But it's minor, uh, minor risk differences are sufficient to justify declining to offer augmentation um, or sort of frivolous modification. Uh, and so this is where I wanted to sort of acknowledge my own biases, right? Because I'm a member of a majority and dominant uh, hearing culture. I've been immersed in hearing culture my whole life, and this culture primarily constructs deafness as a disability. And so I, I am primed to believe that cochlear implant is a medical treatment that brings children who are deaf closer to a normal state of being that I believe that I occupy, um, right? And so to not primarily construct cochlear implant as like cosmetic or socially cosmetic or augmentation. Um, but deaf scholars make the very persuasive argument that a deaf world and deaf culture exists. They have language, institutions, and customs that can be transmitted from senior to junior members in the culture. Although it's not universally transmitted in a heritable fashion, um, like some other cultures may be. Um, and that to be a part of deaf culture is good and desirable, in which case cochlear implant might in fact at its core be a decision to change the patient's cultural identity from one that they coincidentally occupy having been born deaf, which is a minority cultural identity, and to instead have them take on features of or improve access to this majority dominant cultural identity of hearing culture. Um, it is not my intention to take on the entire controversy that kind of emerged in parallel with the development of cochlear implant surgery. Uh, had like very polarized takes as much as like cochlear implant is a miracle cure, uh, which I actually think kind of falsely led people to believe that having the cochlear implant was resulting in children hearing in exactly the way that I hear, um, which is not really the case as Dr. Hunt pointed out, um, or as like an act of cultural obliteration. Uh, I just wanted to take a pause to examine whether the perspectives of deaf people and deaf scholars that were raised in that controversy can push us to reconsider the valence of some of the claims we might make around cochlear implant, like cochlear implant is good for this patient or this patient has a right to access cochlear implant when we're considering the vaccine mandate. Uh, but personally, I think rather than trying to declare one or the other, right, I like to say that bioethics is rarely determined on a technicality. Uh, I think we can understand the cochlear implant is more of a culturally embedded tool. So it's not good or right, and it's not frivolous or bad uh, in itself. And we can try to make sense of this case without trapping ourselves in some kind of mindset that we're then gonna be embarrassed trying to occupy when confronted with a subtly different case. So for this patient, um, deafness and visual language would be a way to access one culture, but it sounds like they're subject to significant impairments that would affect access to that culture. And they're not born into a community that also accesses that culture. So there's a lot of additional limitations above and beyond um, what other deaf children might experience for this particular patient. And then cochlear implant and then developing uh, partial hearing and verbal language are a way to access another culture. And it's a culture that actually intersects with the patient's family, uh, which I think is a it's another context that I think 
is worthy of appreciation here. Now, many deaf children are born to hearing parents and enter the deaf community and are immersed in deaf culture and successful in that regard. But it's, I think, a reasonable um, position for these parents to be taking to say that they don't think that their child is going to have the same opportunities um, to enter and benefit from being a member of deaf culture. And they think that pursuing membership in or access to easier access to hearing culture is a good fit for their child. All right, and I was told to talk about bundling. So I wanted to give you this example, perhaps you've encountered it, right? No substitutions, modifications, alterations, or deletions. Yes, really. So if restaurants can do it, why can't we? <laughs> I just want to point out that bundle is just a word. It's a word that sounds a little nicer than mandates, right? It sounds cuddly, but bundle means different things. So there's an idea of services being bundled because they are truly integral to one another. It is not technically feasible to access the core service without agreeing to the peripheral service. Now, you could get technical, right? I said technicalities are not the be all and end all of ethics anyways, so you can pick around at that idea, but I think this is one extreme of what a bundle can be. Then there's what we've been talking about, which is a bundle as a mandate. So bundle is just a different word for saying that we are gonna impose this mandate. We are choosing to make access to the core service contingent upon agreeing to the peripheral service. And that's artificial, right? There's nothing technically essential about that relationship. They are related, but the fact that we have made it an absolute requirement is artificial. And then there's another way that we can be thinking about bundling that I think is a lot better for everybody, which is bundling as a responsibility on the side of the healthcare team. So that when choosing to deliver the core service, the healthcare team inherently assumes responsibility for delivering, ensuring, or at least promoting the peripheral services, right? So I think this language of bundling is useful, but it is actually most useful in helping us to organize our care delivery systems and reinforcing our responsibility to promote the related services that we are able to recognize have a meaningful connection, even if they are not an integral bundle. If you wanted to make an argument to justify a bundle as mandate, I think these are the types of arguments you would have to turn to, right? You might, you would have to say that the outcome that arises when a partial bundle is permitted is unacceptable, even if the patient or parent desired that outcome. There's just no way for that outcome to exist in the world, period. You might say that a partial bundle outcome results in negative externalities that affects third parties or communities. And, right, because that may be true, but that is just a comment about good or not good, right? And a comment about fair, there is a strict duty to avoid such negative externalities or the negative externalities satisfies some of our justificatory conditions. So justifying the downsides of bundling to avoid the negative externalities of a partial bundle outcome. So this is the kind of justification that works kind of for bundling things like vaccination with transplantation. If you're going to argue that we have a duty to other candidates to create a safe context for them to pursue transplantation and the negative externalities of the intersecting risk of non-vaccination and immunosuppression for transplant are at least proportional to the burdens of vaccination imposed by the mandate. And then the last one, and this is the one that works for restaurants, is that executing the partial bundle treatment is so resource intensive that it substantially interferes with third parties or communities. Like, we know you don't want blue cheese on your cob salad, but we do not have time to pick all the cheese out of that salad, right? We're not gonna be able to deliver anybody's food if we have to pull all of the pomegranate seeds out of your pomegranate margarita. Uh, but I think we can acknowledge that for vaccination and surgery, the services are distinct enough and vaccination as a service is kind of simple enough that it would be hard to make this restaurant argument. The other reason restaurants get to do this and we don't is because restaurant chefs uh, are not <laughs> imbued with the same duties that healthcare workers are. So they can enjoy a right to refuse service to anybody, which we do not. All right, so I wanted to leave off with my favorite things, right, moral, 
fair and proper, uh, and then hand it up to the evaluation slide. We have occasionally um, had payers refuse coverage for cochlear implantation. Um, we usually get that reversed, but on occasion we haven't. In the hospital, we've been able to um, obtain un use of un uncomp uh, uncompensated care funds uh, from the hospital for these patients. Um, we also have had insurance companies recently deny coverage because they didn't have the documentation of vaccination and vaccination completion was a criterion for their uh, approval. Regardless of whether or not we could ever get those kinds of decisions reversed, if we were in the situation with this patient that they were denied coverage because they didn't vaccinate and, uh, uh, and it was only because of the family's decision to not vaccinate, how would our program decide to pursue uncompensated care, which is clearly a, a, a scarce resource? Wow. Yeah, I think that's a really heavy question. You're right. It is a scarce resource. And I think it is really annoying to be constrained to do something that feels not quite right by someone else doing something that is wrong. So I think that it is wrong on the part of insurance companies uh, to make themselves sort of the authority for bundling, because it's hard for me to imagine that their bundle is a bundle as responsibility, right? It, They've decided that they will take on responsibility for protecting children and ensuring uh, that they receive cochlear implants in the best of all possible contexts. And they're really just taking on the extra work themselves to make the world a better place. It's hard for me to imagine that that's the case. It's hard to, for me to imagine that uh, they are adhering to high standards for procedural legitimacy and deciding to establish that bundle. And so now what you're responding to is not so much a situation of, oh boy, you know, the uh, I guess the best use of these uh, scarce resource is to provide cochlear implant surgery to a non-vaccinated child. What you're responding to, in my mind, is, and perhaps this is a little bit petty, you say, like, oh, a very convincingly good use of this scarce resource is to redress the wrong committed by the insurance company who's denied cochlear implant surgery to this child. And I'm going to take on that responsibility. I'm sorry, we are coming to the end of, of our grand rounds, but um, I, uh, please join me at least virtually in, in, in thanking both of our presenters again. This was a really interesting conversation. Um, two other announcements. Please do consider coming to grand rounds again next week. My friend Ray Bignall is presenting. He's wonderful and inspirational. Uh, and also, please do consider joining us uh, for our annual summer bioethics conference, July 19th and 20th of 2024. Our upcoming theme this year will be thinking big, responding ethically, big data and AI in pediatrics. On the 18th, we will also be having uh, an additional day as we did last year of a pre-conference day focusing on ethical issues specific to pediatric nursing care, although not exclusive to pediatric nursing care. Anyhow, thank you again for joining us.